Good evening. This is quite a crowd. <laughs> Must be a good book. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Uh, my, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Uh, over the past 12 years now, the Levy Center has awarded 44 major fellowships to working biographers. Four such $72,000 fellowships are awarded each year, and now five, actually. Uh, to date, some 20 biographies have been published, including Ruth Franklin's biography of Shirley Jackson, which won the prestigious National Book Circle Critics Award for biography. Uh, just a reminder, our next program is just two days from now on Thursday at 6.30 with Ben Moser talking about his new biography of Susan Sontag. The book has been widely reviewed recently. Uh, <clears throat> Tonight I am delighted we have with us Eleanor Randolph in conversation with Sam Roberts. New Yorkers know Sam Roberts as the longtime New York Times columnist and editor and host of the TV program the New York Times close up with Sam Roberts. But I think of Sam as a prolific biographer. His most recent book is indeed a biography of David Greenglass entitled The Brother, The Untold Story of the Rosenberg Case. But here's the real story about Sam. Most biographers take five, six, or seven years or more to write their works. But <clears throat> Sam now does it about once a week. <laughs> I reference, of course, his wonderfully detailed, often colorful obituaries in the New York Times. The Leon Levy Center has just inaugurated, by chance, an innovative, wholly unique master's program in biography and memoir, starting up this autumn with 17 students. And among other things, they are going to be studying Sam Roberts' mini biographies. <laughs> Eleanor Randolph is a veteran reporter for the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. She covered national politics and published many scoops, including the notorious 1979 story about the time a killer rabbit attacked President Jimmy Carter. <laughs> yes, I'm not making this up. Eleanor's newsbreaking story was headlined Carter has a hair-raising experience <laughs> on Plains Trip. <laughs> Randolph's account had the president parrying and thrusting his oar at the Banzai Bunny. <laughs> Deputy White House Press Secretary Rex Granham refused Randolph's repeated requests for the rabbit photo, saying, quote, there are certain stories about the president that must forever remain shrouded in mystery. <laughs> I kid you not, this comes actually straight out of my own manuscript in progress, a biography of Jimmy Carter, and I'm delighted to be able to quote Eleanor. <laughs> in any case, Eleanor went on to much more august beats. In 1998, she joined the editorial board of the New York Times and only partially stepped away in 2013. I'd like to think that this was when her real career commenced, because that is when she began the long haul to become a biographer. We recruited her, fortunately, as a fellow of the Leon Levy Center for the year 2017-18, and the result is now her stunning new biography, The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg. Sam will interrogate Le Eleanor for about 40 minutes, and then they will take some questions from the audience, and afterwards Eleanor will, has agreed to sign books sold by Books on Call NYC out in, out, just outside the auditorium. So, Eleanor and Sam, tell us about Michael Bloomberg. Thank you, Kai, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight, and thanks to the Levy Center for inviting us. Eleanor has been a longtime colleague of mine at the Times and a guest, of course, and a uh, person, personage on the New York Times close up, and it's always a pleasure to be sitting here with her. Uh, usually I don't ask her questions, but uh, tonight I'm going to. Uh, and oh. 
It's great that you are here to talk about her book because having read the book, I can say it is really worth reading. Uh, David Greenberg in the New York Times book review called it brisk and engaging. And The Guardian had a review of the book the other day and said, indeed, it is an essential read in an era where high-end urban centers and their immediate environs are pulling away from the rest of the country. It is a tale of two Americas. The Times Book Review said, Eleanor, that uh, in spite of Bloomberg's personal flaws, which Greenberg listed as crankiness and a tin ear, and <laughs> policy fiascos, the West Side Stadium project, an anti-democratic procedural end run to secure a third term, Bloomberg ranks by any fair reckoning as one of Gotham's all-time greatest leaders. Would you uh, concur in that assessment? Um, it was such a good review, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, before I really go on, uh, I want to thank uh, Kai and Thad and and the Gotham Center. I mean, I I was here for a year and I so fell in love with with CUNY, uh, the place where we can talk about the city and talk a uh, debate the city. I I absolutely, uh, you know, I I'm so proud proud to see all of you and I hope that uh, I see you again as we go through the year and go to all the other events um, in this program. As for Bloomberg, I, <clears throat> you know, I thought, uh, I sort of, I went back recently and reread the editorial we wrote about to endorse Mark Green for mayor in 2001. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not completely embarrassed by it, but I am certainly aware that we got a few things wrong, like um, that editorial said, for example, that, they, they, uh, that we weren't sure a businessman could really be mayor of New York City. <laughs> and so um, it turns out after studying, I went to the New York City Municipal Archives, which is, Another, another source of heaven in New York City. And uh, it turns out that a businessman can run a city and actually his, his, his management system uh, was something that I think should be studied by mayors across the country. Let me ask you going back to David Greenberg's assessment. <laughs> uh, was the Olympics a fiasco or as Dan Doktoroff, the former deputy mayor wrote, was it a catalyst for getting lots of other things done in the city, even though we didn't get the Olympics and perhaps the West Side Stadium itself was not the greatest idea? Yeah, I, I mean the stadium, I, it, that never quite made sense to me, but Mitchell Moss at NYU wrote, um, a, uh, a paper really that said that New York really won the Olympics because a lot of the things that uh, that Dr. Off and and of course Bloomberg were really working on uh, happened. If you look at look at the west side of Manhattan, I mean that part of the Olympics was. Um, was designed to build that up, but you also had things in Queens. You, I mean, the the New York Times, when um, Bloomberg left, they did this wonderful il illustration to show. How does Eleanor says they now? <laughs> well, this no, it's the newsroom. I always oh. I always call them they, but you know they did this illustration, and it's just beautiful with all the different buildings all over the city. So I think, I mean, Bloomberg would say he won the Olympics. I okay, fine. We talk about the third term, something that Bloomberg had railed against earlier. Wasn't the third term a coup in effect? <laughs> you know, I think there are many, many people in New York who are still angry at him about that third term. And, um, 
and if you look at that election, um, he he had he won by almost 20 points the previous election, and then it was uh, he got 50.7 percent of the vote. He just barely won that election in 2009, and you know, I mean, there were people like me were arguing that he needed to go back to the voters before he went to a third term. But um, actually, my boss there at the New York Times argued that um, because of the recession, we really needed a third term for Michael Bloom Bloomberg. So as you, as you probably know, the New York Times editorial board, uh, including myself, that's what we wrote. You said you voted for Bloomberg, I think, two out of three times. Yeah. Which was the time you didn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt very loyal to the New York Times editorial board, so I voted for Green. Uh, let's go back to that first race, the first uh, Bloomberg mayoral race in 2001. Would he have won without 9-11? I don't know, that's a really, really good question. I have always thought that 9-11, that the city was shaken in such a way that you wanted somebody, um, you, you didn't care about a revolution, you didn't care about reform. What, you, what, what people seemed to care about was stability and bringing the city back. And he was in many ways the perfect choice. You know, he's, uh, um, he's, he was, he ran a company, he, he ran a big company, and, and I think people felt secure with uh, Bloomberg at that point. Would he have won without money? <laughs> or you're just taking it all away now. Uh, that's right. Would he have won, obviously, without his money and the amount of money he spent? Um, look, I don't think, I think it would have been really hard, especially since, um, you know, Gail Collins wrote that there was, that he was on television so much that, um, that, uh, 2001 election that it was like a hologram was running for office. <laughs> and he, he, uh, he used his money well. The one thing that I think a lot of people didn't realize is that he, he was out there a lot, even though, um, even though he couldn't, uh, you know, he had some great speech writers, but he just couldn't give a, a political speech. You know, he couldn't rouse the crowds, he couldn't do that kind of stuff. But he was out there shaking hands and meeting people and, and getting to know the city. Did he like to campaign? He, he told people he did, and you know, he was, he, Chuck Schumer told, said one time that the two of them went into this, I think it was in Queens, and there was this Sweet 16 party going on, and Schumer said to Bloomberg, go on in there, you know, shake hands, get to meet them, and Bloomberg said, oh no, you know, I'll be, that'll be, I'll be intruding on this moment for this 16-year-old. And, and Schumer just almost shoved him into the party. And so, so Bloomberg went around, shook everybody's hand, and he came out and he was just flushed because he just said, my God, they loved me. They <laughs> loved me. That'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> How much money uh, did he spend on the three mayoral races altogether? Well, you know, um, the Times estimated that uh, over 12 years, he spent six, about $650 million. Now that included um, seven, uh, almost, almost half of that was really for the campaigns. But the other half included, he, he paid extra to his staff, and it included airfare, he, you know, he, he, he helped, you know, Commissioner Kelly and people going here and there, so uh, so that and you know he paid for the fish tanks and all kinds of things like that, and so um, <clears throat> I think I think that was it, 650. But you know he was worth four billion when he started, and 
and now he's worth about 56 billion. <laughs> Give or take a good a few investment. <laughs> I don't think anybody would suggest that the mayor was corrupt financially, but was there a sense that the money in any way was corrupting? You, you talk about the fact that he did supplement the salaries of some of the aides, uh, both in the campaign and in the municipal government. And I remember with Nelson Rockefeller making loans to some of the staff members that raised the question of, did they become more loyal to Rockefeller the man than Rockefeller the governor, the public servant? And the philanthropic gifts to various institutions in the city, whether museums or libraries or dance companies, did that muffle dissent on their part? Uh, dissent whether uh, they were called upon to support a third term, for instance. So was that money spent in a corrupting kind of way? Was it corrosive at all to the system, even though it was his money? <clears throat> I, don't, I think you could argue that um, for the third term. I think there was some effort to get people that he had supported to come out. Now, if you talk to those people, which I did to some of them, they said, uh, we were glad to do it. I mean, if you're getting that much money from somebody, you, you, know, you really want that to continue, obviously. Uh, Richard Brodsky said one time that People in in people don't buy Bloomberg. He buys them, and so um, I yeah, I don't know. You look, the Bloomberg people have always said that his money uh, uh, liberated him, so that he did not have to depend on giving a job to anybody. He did not have to depend on. Um, some of the things that you're starting to see with other politicians um, <laughs> might go nameless. No names. <laughs> uh, and what about, uh, what do you think Bloomberg would have been if he didn't have money? Don't say poor. <laughs> but yeah. what, would have, what would he have become, do you think? Obviously, he was a very ambitious, very smart, very upwardly mobile guy, but what would have happened if he didn't have all that money? You know, I don't know. I mean, if you go back to his childhood, he, he was always, he was like an Eagle Scout. He wanted all those badges, all those different things. So he could have gone in a lot of different directions. I think after going to Johns Hopkins, he knew that whatever he did, he wanted to be a manager, he wanted to be a leader. And um, I'm convinced that's how he got into Harvard Business School, um, since for a while, at least at Johns Hopkins, he didn't have the greatest grades in the world. But he was, as he said himself, a big man on campus. And so that you know, that was, he wanted to be a leader in some way. And he has often said, I'm not a writer, I'm not an investor, I'm not a truck driver, I'm not anything. What I am is a, is a manager. I make decisions, some good, some bad, but that's what I do. And also an engineer, right? Yes, well, he trained as an engineer in, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. And what did that give him? What advantages do you think that gave him in terms of building a career. You know, when he started his media, uh, the, the uh, Bloomberg Media, he, um, Matthew Winkler, he hired Ma Matthew Winkler from um, the Wall Street Journal, and Winkler said that the first day he came to work, he came to work at eight o'clock, and he said the first thing that Bloomberg said to him um, <clears throat> was, uh, Good morning, nice to have you here so late, you know. I mean, <laughs> Bloomberg always arrived about seven or shortly after dawn. Anyway, as, um, as uh, Winkler was trying to figure out how to sort of start this media empire, Bloomberg handed him a sheet of paper and he said it was a perfect engineer outline. It said, first, we're gonna do A, 
one, two, three, four, B, one, two, three, four. And, uh, you know, I always thought that was kind of how he operated. It was very methodical, very, um, uh, he, he wanted to fix things. He wanted things done within a certain time limit. Um, and so, you know, the, the engineer had, had, engineering had taught him to think in a methodical way. We all think we know someone when we cover them, but when you research a book, obviously you get to know them, particularly biography, a lot better. When you finished this book, Eleanor, did you see Mike Bloomberg in a different light than when you started? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, remember, I endorsed Mark Green, so. <laughs> did you see Mark Green in a different light? Slightly. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I have said this a lot. I think this is a, uh, this is a man who he went through these lives. He really improved with age. Um, now, um, when he was on Wall Street, I mean, he was a jerk. If we'd stopped the clock there, you know, I think uh, there would, I mean, if that would be the one life and. And, you know, the title for that book would be, What a Jerk, you know, because he was not, he was not anybody I would have liked. But... He got a $10 million payout, though. Well, for yeah. For a jerk. For a jerk, that's pretty good, though. No. No. And then he started this company, and he changed Wall Street in some ways, and it became a really important... Uh, part of the way that Wall Street moved along. And, um, and then I, when he became mayor of New York, one of the things that I think is really important is that we talked about what Bloomberg did to and for the city. But uh, I believe that the city also changed Bloomberg. And it made him realize that the power of local government, the power of, um, of a mayor who deals day after day with, with um, a, constituent who, a constituent whose garbage has not uh, been picked up or, um, or the too much noise coming from the street. All the details of, of life in a city the mayor has to deal with that. And so he, so what you saw after he left um, City Hall was that he began to really try to help mayors around the world and also in some ways to organize mayors. He'd, he'd, he'd organize mayors to fight, um, to fight uh, for gun control and to fight illegal weapons. But he also, what, when Donald Trump <clears throat> decided that he was going to take um, the United States out of the Paris Accords, 22 hours later, Bloomberg was in Paris with Emmanuel Macron, and he had declared that <clears throat> city by city and state by state, that was Jerry Brown was helping him on the states, they were, the, the United States of America was going to, uh, to accept the Paris Accords and to bring the uh, pollution down to the levels that had been promised in those uh, agreements. And so, so that's what he's been doing. He, he's, he sort of believes in the power of mayors and I find that Fascinating. And, and in a way, creating a government in exile. What? In a way, creating a government in exile. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, in so many ways, he's got the money and the clout to do, to, to fight Trump and the environmental disasters that Trump is, um, is bringing to this country. And so, um, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry he didn't run for president, but uh, <laughs> somebody else is too. <laughs> but, 
you know, uh, okay, I know, maybe he couldn't have gotten through the primaries. Uh, I think he could have beaten Trump if he'd made it through the, primary, the, through the primaries. But is it fair to say he, the chances are, uh, obviously last March he decided, the chances are he couldn't have made it through the Democratic primary. I, well, I think it's two things. One, <clears throat> I think um, that the Democratic Party has gotten much more liberal than he is. He's a centrist. He really is. He's, he's never liked parties very much. He's been a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, and now a Democrat again. And so, he, first of all, the party has moved a lot. And secondly, I think the one centrist in, in the group is uh, Biden. And, and I think he didn't want to take away from Biden, although I don't know that personally. You quote uh, the former mayor as saying that uh, Donald Trump was not a businessman, is not a businessman. He was a real estate salesman. Uh, and drawing the distinction there, and you had a wonderful line that you quoted uh, recently about an escalator. Uh, harkening back to uh, Trump's announcement at Trump Tower. <laughs> um, yes, well, uh, you know, Bloomberg said, and I think some, well, I'll tell you the quote first. He said, why do you want to um, stand on an escalator? He said, I always walk up an escalator. And you can rest. You can rest later. You can rest when you die. I have <laughs> I have not been on an escalator since I read that quote, that I don't <laughs> trudge up, you know, and, and push people aside trying to, to get to the top. Um, some company, I, and I, I couldn't find it, but I heard some company wanted to put that, uh, that saying sort of near the escalator in their building, but I haven't found it. Probably Otis. <laughs> We're pretty sure that he read all or most or part of the book. Do you think he learned anything about himself? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, uh, one of the things, he did call me, one of the things I said to him is that it appears to me that you improved with age. You got better as you got older and he, um, he said, oh, everybody does that. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, I think he, I don't know whether he, I, that's a hard question, Sam. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Let's talk a little bit about the process of writing the book. When you interviewed him, and he was fairly cooperative in the process, was there anything he wouldn't answer or anything that was off limits? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a trick question. <laughs> it is a trick question. <laughs> you, as you know, there are some things I didn't ask him, and I told you this the other day. I did not ask him about his sex life. And so, um, but we agreed when I asked this question to Eleanor the other day that it probably, in the case of Michael Bloomberg, it isn't really relevant. Uh, <laughs> it's the kind of question you might want to ask Donald Trump. <laughs> but in the case of Bloomberg, if you're doing a biography, particularly on the many lives that he's led, it isn't really relevant to any of them, is it? No, not any of these lives anyway. I mean, if he had some secret life, I did not find it. Uh, that is for the next biographer, for the next three or four lives. Is there a difference in interviewing him for a book as opposed to interviewing him for a newspaper profile or when you're interviewing him for the Times or some other fashion? You know, when, when, I, when we interviewed him for the Times editorial board, it was almost always on background. And um, so, um, but I will tell you this one story. Um, one of the first times he came to the editorial board, um, it was he, was, he wanted nonpartisan city elections. And so, um, 
so we went on, he talked about all this sort of stuff and, and at some point in the interview, um, I said to him, how are you gonna get uh, this city with all the Democrats and all the unions to go for a nonpartisan election? And he turned around to me and he's just started yelling. And he's, and it was just astonishing. Everybody, I mean, um, everybody who was sitting there sort of said, said, good night. In fact, this friend of mine who was sitting next to me started sort of pulling away so he, he, he wouldn't get in the blast. Um, and uh, anyway, so, but we got some pretty good answers, as I recall. But it, I, you have to know, after we left this meeting, he came up to me, gave me a little kiss on the cheek, and said, you know, um, I hope that you'll keep going to Albany, or, you know, just little social things, because... Keep I, going to Albany and not staying at City Hall, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> he meant me, go to Albany, not him. I, I think, I don't think he ever liked going to Albany, if you want to know the truth. What about the, the crankiness that the... Times reviewer uh, alluded to, and the tin ear. What what was he missing about New York and New Yorkers uh, that he didn't get? And did he ever learn to hear things in, in a clearer, more lucid way? You know, I, I mean, as a journalist, we loved not only the crankiness, but his ability to just blurt things out all the time and. You know, he would, on Friday afternoons, he would go um, get, do this radio show and, and he would relax on the radio show. And of course the tabs, I mean, every time he went, uh, he somehow managed to give the tabs the lead for the Saturday paper because he was, he would just say, outrageous things. He, uh, at one point, you know, he was talking about, he was talking about how, um, as a golfer, you know, what would we do without immigration because all these people work on the, you know, work on the golf courses. And of course, um, the people who run the golf courses immediately, you know, talked to the Daily News and said, look, everybody who works on my golf course is legal, forget it. <laughs> And, but, you know, he just, I mean, that was one of the things that I found almost endearing. He just could not stop. Uh, there was not a governor there that stopped him from saying some of these uh, things that he was thinking. And um, so I think that's also one of the ways that he, uh, one of the reasons people thought he was so, so, boring and stiff is that I think he was, I think he was holding some of that stuff back. Well, but what do you think that was about? I mean, he didn't like the press asking where he was for the weekend, whether he was in Bermuda or here. Uh, he didn't care whether people thought he had a diverse staff. He knew he had the best, smartest staff that he could possibly put together. Was this a tone deaf kind of attitude? Or was it a, uh, a self, you know, uh, not serving, but a, a self-confident sense that uh, he knew what was right and it didn't matter what all these other politically correct uh, tangential things were all about? Uh, I mean, you know, strength works in a lot of different ways. I think he was... A I think he was a very strong mayor, and, a, and, he, and one of the things he very often said is if the polls are, if you're, you're being hammered in the polls, that's, that means you're probably doing something right. And if, if you're not, you're on the baby slopes. You're not really, you know, you're not really skiing at your full capacity. And so he, um, I mean, the privacy thing was always fascinating to me because he loved this open bullpen, but he wanted that privacy for himself. I mean, um, there were a lot of co interesting contradictions, and, and that was one of them. What was it about him that you found most interesting that you didn't know before? Well, you know, 
I didn't realize he was so funny. I didn't realize Neither that. Neither did I. I know. <laughs> he, he has a really sort of good sense of humor. It's very tough. I got used to that kind of humor in journalism, but uh, it, it's sort of a Wall Street, you know, uh, kind of humor like, you know, um, <clears throat> well, the Wall Street humor was a, a body humor, wasn't it? Well, it could be, or it just could be rough, you know? I mean, um, you know, hey, Harvard, get me coffee, or, you know, they, they really, they were really, whatever weakness you had, it, it became, the, you know, you couldn't hide from it in, on Wall Street. And so, um, so I found that humor sort of, Funny. I mean, I, I, recently I, I said, you know, that he and I were the same age, and I said, I'm, you know, I'm 76. He said, really? You don't look a day over 75. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> if, if you talk about not necessarily failures, but some of the negatives, regardless of what you think of the issues themselves. You can look at his, I guess, stubbornness when it comes to the West Side Stadium, when it comes to stop and frisk, uh, which he wouldn't give an inch on. Why wouldn't he yield on that? Why wouldn't he see the other side on either of those issues at all? You know, um I think stop and frisk is much more important. And what I found when I sort of looked at it was that um, this, the, that Bloomberg in 2005, and maybe earlier than that, decided to go after the National Rifle Association. His, his political people said, look, you do not want to do that. You know, first of all, they they destroy people politically, but secondly, they all have guns, <laughs> and so you know he uh, he said no, and he he got all the mayors you know mayors from around the country he got them interested in gun control and and interested primarily in dealing with getting rid of illegal guns, and he he when he saw that the iron pipe pipeline was um, was affecting his city these were this is well, this was their term for what what would happen is people would go down to Virginia and Georgia and places like that and buy uh, guns and then bring them back to the city of New York where it was illegal so um, they they um, they did a kind of scam they went they went down and you know one guy, uh, pretended um, that uh, to be the guy who was going to buy the gun, and the other guy uh, really had a terrible record, and all the ways, they just sort of found a lot of ways that these illegal guns were getting to the city of New York. So, so uh, I knew from that that, that Bloomberg was just hell-bent on getting rid of guns in the city of New York. And when... Uh, the Terry stops became a way to uh, stop people if, they, if the police felt that they had guns. They began, uh, Kelly began using that, commissioner, police commissioner Kelly began using that more and more. And, you know, it just, it, it just got completely out of hand. It was like, it was, it's, it's one of the real dents in what is otherwise a pretty good legacy for Bloomberg. And, and he, he, he was loyal to his people, and he was loyal to Kelly, even when um, these uh, Terry stops or stop and frisk got to be more, to more than 700,000 people one year. And um, it was... You wonder, I don't know the reason why a Bloomberg couldn't hear what the rest of us could hear. If you looked at the court case, you saw that some of the police um, in the city uh, had already started worrying about 
how, how unfair this system had become. He eventually, Bloomberg eventually um, got Kelly to scale back, but it, um, you know, he still defends Kelly and he still, that loyalty is still there. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it, he, he, he still says that today. It was also hard to disprove a negative. Uh, of, out of 700,000 stops, they relatively rarely found any guns, but they would say the reason was because people were afraid that they might be stopped so they weren't carrying guns. That's right. Uh, let me ask you, in the Times Review, uh, the reviewers said that in today's fiercely partisan climate, Bloomberg probably could not get elected mayor a technocrat like Bloomberg. What do you think? I, I actually think he could get elected mayor. I mean, you know, if he, I, I can't imagine that he'd want to, want to do it again, but I think he probably could get elected mayor. I mean, look, he's worth a lot more money now. He could spend a lot more money on ads. Um, but also, I think, for for the flaws, you know, which we've which we've touched on here, a lot of people, a lot of New Yorkers uh, feel feel that he was a very very good mayor, very solid mayor. Well, and all right. Let me ask you a totally unfair question. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> you you have Mike Bloomberg for three terms. We've had almost two terms of Bill De Blasio. Mike Bloomberg, <laughs> Mike Bloomberg did not do much for public housing. Right. He did not do much for improving things on Rikers Island. Uh, crime is still going down. Uh, the city's economy under a liberal or progressive mayor is doing pretty well. Uh, joblessness is at record lows. So how would you describe the difference between Bloomberg and de Blasio. You're right, that is an unfair question. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> My friend Sam. So, um, look, if you, let's start with the schedule. <laughs> the, um, you know, if you look at, at I, I used to read Bloomberg's schedules. They started at seven o'clock in the morning and they usually ended up you know, uh, at a gala or something like that late at night. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, just reading the schedules was exhausting. And But so, remember what, what Jimmy Walker said. He said, see, imagine what they'd, have, what they'd have to pay me if I showed up full time. <laughs> no. So and maybe de Blasio is so good he doesn't have to show up full time. <laughs> oh, really? Well... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, and the, the other thing is, you know, I, for one thing, Bloomberg had to deal with a lot of disasters. He had to deal with the 9-11 uh, and the economy was really going down the tubes. He had to deal with uh, the problems with the economy in the Great Recession, 2008 and 2009. De Blasio doesn't have any of that. Uh, you know, um, Bloomberg had... Um, uh, um, hurricanes and and huge um, snow blizzards, blizzageddon, as somebody called it, and so uh, De Blasio hasn't really had that. That's that's the second thing. The other thing is <clears throat> that um, that I hate to quote Mitchell Moss twice in one evening, but. Mitchell has always said that de Blasio is a living on, is, is, is living on uh, Mike Bloomberg's gas fumes. And so, and what he means by that, I think, is that, is that Bloomberg had set up so much in the time he was there. You know, I mean, 40% of the city was rezoned. Uh, and if you, I mean, who else would put in an addition to the subway system? 
what other mayor would actually do that? They, the, the, whole, um, the whole thing is that the state takes, is, runs the subway system. Anyway, um, I just, if you look at the list of things that Bloomberg did in those 12 years, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, amazing. And if you look at the list of things that de Blasio has done, so far, I mean, uh, pre-K is really good and really important, and I think that was great. But I, you know, I really struggled to get beyond that. Let's take some questions from the audience. Please, questions, not speeches, and come up to the mics, if you would, so everybody can hear you. Sorry. Yes, sir, Steve. So just following up on the unfair question um, that Sam asked, uh, I assume that you, in fact, in interviewing uh, the former mayor, talked, to, talked about other mayors, including de Blasio, and you mentioned that he, in fact, organizes other mayors. So um, as, has, did he talk to you about his views on de Blasio? And if not, what do you think they would be? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um. You know, he made a point when he got out of office to, to make sure that he did not mention de Blasio, did not say anything, and it must have driven him completely crazy. It would have driven me crazy to listen to the fact that he was blamed for every, you right. know. If he didn't say anything on Inauguration Day, he was That's, pretty that's, restrained. That's right. Inauguration Day, you know, he was accused of running the city like a plantation, and but he made sure he sent word out to all his people, do not react to whatever de Blasio says. It is not our, um, it, it is not our job. Uh, we are no longer in the city. We no longer have power over what can be done or can't be done. And um, I don't want, and they were pretty good about this. They, uh, Bloomberg made one, one exception that I know of, maybe, and I can't think of any others, but after there was this huge investigation of the way 911 was, uh, <clears throat> was uh, operating, um, he got um, Cass Holloway, who had been one of the top people dealing with 911, to issue a report in response to that. But except for that, they were, pretty mum through, you know, through thick and thin, a lot yes, of thin. Sure. Most people I've, I've known who got a buyout on Wall Street, at, even in their 30s, took that money, put it in bonds, and lived <laughs> off the interest for the rest of their lives. What made Bloomberg, what, what gave him the guts? I mean, he, he, he did it in a very measured, and uh, I, I, I know that a lot more, and I don't want to get into it, but what made him, what gave him the personal quality to risk everything he had, everything he got, and to start over again and, and start a company? He could have just retired on that money, on that buyout. So, you know, um, <clears throat> he said um, in his autobiography that he loved risk that he loved this sort of panic when it hit his stomach. I mean, I can't imagine it, but he, 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 he really cared about uh, being out there on that edge. Um, the important thing about um, getting that $10 million was that he was essentially fired. He was fired from Solomon Brothers, but before he was fired, they demoted him and, and, th and sent him upstairs to what was considered women's work, and this was the computer section of Solomon Brothers. And instead of, you know, dragging around and moaning about his fate, he learned everything he could about computers. And when he, when he left, he knew that he, he knew that traders like him and, needed more than just a sort of computerized ticker tape and he created this um, he created this machine and he and three other um, three other young sort of 
techy, smarty guys uh, created this machine, and uh, you know they were among the first. They were the first that 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 showed how um, if you that what happened was that they did bonds, and it, the bond market was sort of crazy at that point. And what the, what Bloomberg and his friends did was they showed a bond trader whether or not the bond was worth it. Uh, and what if this happened and what if that happened? And that, that had not been there before and it was very revolutionary. And of course, it made him a billionaire. Yes, sir. You were. Could you do a mind experiment? What, what, how would Bloomberg possibly have handled Amazon? And uh, what about Bloomberg and Cuomo compared to de Blasio and Cuomo? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's possible for a New York mayor and a New York governor to get along. I mean, <laughs> Sam is, probably knows more about this than I do. Um, but uh, one of my favorite sort of events was when Bloomberg and Cuomo uh, decided they were going to have a contest to see who could race down um, one of the rapids in the Adirondacks. <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> they had this race, and the pictures of it are wonderful. W one member of the audience actually has one picture. And um, anyway, so they raced and raced, and when they got to the end, Cl Cuomo um, who, uh, who the the timekeeper w worked for Cuomo, <laughs> and the Cuomo's um, timekeeper said that Cuomo amazingly had won by 18 seconds. So my friend here had a picture of the event and took it to Bloomberg. And he said, would you sign my, and it's, this is a wonderful picture of the water all churning and all that sort of stuff. And Bloomberg wrote on it, 18 seconds, my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. You mentioned uh, stop and frisk as one of the big dents in Bloomberg's reputation. Um, in addition to that, uh, Bloomberg's education policies, including uh, eliminating zoned schools and increasing the number of screened high schools and middle schools throughout the city, those are often being blamed today for the uh, segregation in the, in the city's schools. Um, is it fair to say that Bloomberg had a very damaging blind spot when it came to race? Um, you know, I, I think he tried very hard to make the schools fair for more uh, students. And you, you know, what he, what I saw was a guy who wanted a certain amount of competition uh, so that students could, um, uh, schools could actually compete for students. And the schools that were not any good would, would like a, a, a bad company, would disappear. Now, <clears throat> I mean, the New York City school system is so big and so complex that um, some of the things he did didn't work. But the main thing he did that did work was that he took over the schools. And that was, uh, anybody who, who's been here long enough knows what a, what, a, what a difficult place it was to run with 32 school boards and every politician in the city thinking that they could have a hand in here and there. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think he, he tried very hard to, to give more students access to better schools. And, you know, you can argue that, that it didn't happen the way he wanted to, but wanted it to, but that was his aim. And just getting control of the system was right. an accomplishment in That's itself. That's right. That's what I said. Yes. Hi. I remember, um, I think it was the third term, we had all those folks protesting on Wall Street about the 1%. I forgot what they were called. And he was on Face the Nation, and he was, what were they? Uh, 
occupy. Yeah, occupy Wall Street. <laughs> well, he's from Wall Street, but he was he was on Face the Nation, and he was, um, you know, advocating for himself, like he didn't want the millionaires' tax, which Cuomo said was like this tiny percentage of one percent, which passed anyway. But it just seemed kind of biased and self-interested, <laughs> you know, to hear him advocate for that. I don't know. Um, so I don't know if you do. You, do you have any um, insight? Sort of, on, were those two a reaction to each other? It was he was in office and they were on Wall Street and mm -hmm. protesting and and he was saying, you know, talking about the economy and the free market and you know taxation uh, on the upper crust. You know, it's not going to do anything. You know, it trickles down. But I guess he was self-interested. It seemed to me, if you're uh, you govern for the majority, you don't govern for yourself. Well, you know, I I think he always said that the city benefited by having as many rich people here as possible. And he, um, you know, he, he would say that all the time, bring in the rich. First of all, they spend money, they, you know, they buy apartments, they, they uh, hire people, they do all that. So he, I think he felt the more, uh, as many rich people as possible. The second thing is the, um, the the Wall Street issue was Zuccotti Park, if you remember that, and and that was um, basically uh, what happened was that finally the people that ran the park asked for it to be cleared, and so um, eventually that was what happened. I I had friends who were in the protests, and I had friends who lived nearby the protests, and. And of course, what drove them, the people who lived nearby, what drove them absolutely crazy was the drums. They would do drums all yeah. night long. So, um, it, you know, he, I was interested that he let that go for a long time and he waited until the people who, I, people who ran the park asked for it to be cleared and it was finally cleared. Yes, sir. I'm curious if there were any subjects where you found that Mayor Bloomberg did express some either regret or, you know, second guessing where he may have said, geez, you know, we thought this was going to work one way and in hindsight it really didn't and I would have done this differently. You know, you mentioned stop and frisk, he still has the same position, but I didn't know if there were other topics where he just said we screwed that up or this was totally different outcome than we thought it would be. Well, you know, he has often said failure is really an important form of progress. And um, so there were several things that, that they did that didn't work. One of them was they tried to pay uh, the, the best teachers extra uh, money. And, and it didn't, they decided it didn't work because it, they went to, it, the money would go to the school and it wouldn't go to the best teachers, it would just go to everybody in the school. So it, that sort of system didn't work and he you know, admitted that it didn't work. And, um, and, but he, he likes and he, he liked and he likes to find a sort of positive side to things that don't work. If you, you know, like the big gulp, like the 16 ounce call. So, um, I mean, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, he, they argue, he argued that they never wanted to ban 16 ounces. What they wanted, uh, to, you, could have, you could have the biggest Coke in the entire world as long as it was in four smaller glasses, you know. <laughs> And so the whole idea was that you would realize how much sugar was in that drink. And so um, they, you know, they lost on all these court levels. But um, Bloomberg has said since then that he thought in some ways they won because people realize that these big super slurps or whatever they are, you know, uh, the big gulps are you know, they're sugar. They're mostly sugar, and they and and they people began to realize this was really not good for you. 
Thank you to Kai Bird, the Leon Levy Center. Thanks to all of you for coming. And Eleanor will be signing her book just outside in the lobby. I recommend it highly.